That inspired and well-equipping word of the Lord, which forms our sermon text this morning, comes us from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, beginning with verse 22. Then Paul stood up in front of the council of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which had been inscribed to an unknown God. Now what you worship as unknown, this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands, as if he needed anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and everything they have. From one man, he made every nation of mankind to live over the entire face of the earth. He determined the appointed times and the boundaries where they would live. He did this so that they would seek God and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own prophets have said, indeed we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and planning. Although God overlooked the times of ignorance, he is now commanding all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he appointed. He provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them started to scoff. But others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. So Paul left the council. However, some men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council of the Areopagus, and a woman named Demarius, as well as others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy. Grace and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear fellow redeemed, would you describe yourself as religious? If someone described you with that word, religious, well, would that offend you? Well, with the way that term is often thought about today, it very well could be offensive. Oh, that person... Yeah, they're very religious. The concept seems to be like there's a pious overtone to that word, religious. Like somehow the person who considers himself or is considered to be religious is somehow superior to the rest of us. But if you are religious, I like to think that all of us here today are, you know the way that concept is perceived is not really what it is all about. Being religious is not about being superior. Rather, it is admitting that we are fundamentally flawed. Real religion is not about trying to claim that we are great, pious people. Rather, real religion is about admitting that we are dead in our trespasses and our sins, and there's nothing we can do to fix that. Real religion is not boasting how great we are, Real religion is boasting how great our Savior is. In our sermon text this morning, the Apostle Paul addressed people that he diagnosed to be very religious. Yet they had a problem that a lot of people have. While they were religious, they did not know the real God. They placed their religiousness in the wrong place. Thus, their religiousness was faulty. Paul, in this text, is trying to fix that. He is trying to take that attitude and point it in the correct place. He was trying to make known to them what they described as an unknown God. But the more things change, the more things stay the same. Today, it's not very popular to be looked at as religious. Today, it is more in line with common thought that truth, that's subjective. Religion is therefore something that you subjectively, personally feel. It's not something that is absolutely true. 
People say, well, you live your truth, then I'll live mine. The problem with that popular thought is that there is only one ultimate real truth. Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. Now, if that isn't your truth, then you simply do not have the truth. Yet the beauty of this truth is that it is open to all. God desires all men to come to the knowledge of him, to repent, and to be saved, as Paul is trying to do here in, the, in front of the Athenians. Paul says here, he that is God is not far from each one of us. God is our creator. He is our judge. He is, as the writer of the Hebrews calls him, the author and the finisher of our faith. He himself made what we believe to be valid. And he has given us the proof of that. Now, for some, this proof is inconclusive. But for those who believe, it is proof that without a doubt, we shall live with him forever in heaven. And so we pray, O Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. To understand what Paul is talking about here, first we need to go over the circumstance that brought him to where he was and the spiritual condition of these people to whom he was preaching. This was near, this Acts 17 is near the end of what is known as Paul's second missionary journey. Paul, Silas, and Timothy went as far west as Troas. They tried to go north, but the, the Acts tells us the Spirit of God did not allow that. So they didn't really know what to do, and then Paul sees this vision. A man of Macedonia standing and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So that's what they did. They moved farther west into the area known as Greece. Many of the areas that they would visit on that trip in Greece are familiar to us because they would have books of the Bible, letters that Paul wrote to them later. They visited Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and then finally Corinth. A situation arose, though, that left Silas and Timothy in Berea while Paul was sent ahead down to Athens to await them before moving on. So here Paul is in Athens waiting for his companions. And what he finds when he walks around this city is that it is a very religious scene. Although it is, of course, the wrong religion. Acts 17 verse 16 says, Now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Paul walked around this great city of iniquity, or antiquity and saw that it was given over to many different gods. It was said that in Athens there were more gods than there were people. So vast and famous were the false gods of the Greeks that I think even all of us here today have a common knowledge of who they were. They worshipped gods such as Zeus, gods such as Poseidon, and Athena, which of course is who this city is named after. Now, this was hardly Paul's first encounter with these Greek gods. A few chapters back in Acts, Paul and Silas healed a lame man, and when they did this, the people wanted to worship them as Zeus and Hermes. This was the prevailing thought, the religious belief that is in the area at the time. And Paul, while he was certainly aware of these false gods, he had never seen a city that was so completely given over to them. Their temple, the Parthenon, with which we still have the ruins here today, at its height of its glory, rivaled even Solomon's temple. Paul could most likely see that building from where he was preaching there that day. Their whole culture was so ingrained with this false polytheism, Paul couldn't help but notice just how rampant it was. So when he was talking in the marketplace, naturally the subject of who the true God was came up, and eventually he was invited to bring his ideas, as they called them, to this Areopagus, <clears throat> which in Greek literally means the hill of Ares, their so-called god of war. And while the Athenian culture was overcome with this polytheism. They also considered themselves to be great thinkers of their day. They did come up with democracy after all. They always wanted to hear new ideas and consider them, so Paul was given an opportunity to express his thoughts and his ideas in front of these people. 
But where was he to begin? Well, if we break down what Paul says there that day as a sermon, which it most certainly was, whether they knew it or not, his introduction is most attention-grabbing. Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which had been inscribed to an unknown God. Now what you worship is as unknown, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Paul could have started off by stating the obvious. He could have denounced all their false gods, all their false idols, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he starts with the fact that they were very religious. This is, of course, true. The problem was that their religious fervor was placed in the wrong gods. But he was going to introduce them to the real God. They already had an altar built to him, but they didn't know who he was. The altar said to an unknown god. These Athenians believed in so many different gods that they wanted to cover all their bases, and they built one to the unknown god just in case they had missed one. By introducing the Lord to them in this fashion as the unknown god, well, certainly they would have been on the edge of their seats. And one of the most awesome qualities of our God, the one true God, that is, is that he is made known. Paul's job was making known this God to people all over the nation. Here he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as if he need anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and everything they have. This was indeed a very different message than what they were used to. Paul wasn't talking about many different gods and goddesses as they were accustomed to. Rather, he preached one, one true God. The idea of monotheism, that there was only one God, would be very foreign to them. The idea that the one God who was responsible for the creation of the world and everything in it, again, would have been bizarre to them. Their system said that there was a God for everything. They had a God of wine, a goddess of love, a God of war, a God of the sun. For there to be only one God responsible for all of creation was definitely different. Paul also tells them that he didn't reside in one location, like a temple, nor could he be replicated or formed by human hands, Paul was making known to them in very specific, definite detail who this unknown God was. How could Paul make these things known to these people? Well, they had been known to him. He had learned them. He, when he was young, of course, learned the Old Testament and the Torah. But there was more than just that Jesus Christ would call Paul himself to preach the new message of Christ crucified. This was not a different message than what Paul learned in the Torah, but rather the fulfillment of it. And God has been made known to us as well. We too have learned the Bible and who and what God really is. What an advantage scripture is for us. We can literally pick up the word of God and read what his will is. When we have problems, we don't have to wonder about what God says to us. It is written down for us. We don't have to seek some oracle at Delphi or read into tea leaves or other signs to see what God's will is. No, his word is expressly written down for us. This is made possible by God verbally inspiring men to write down his words throughout the centuries. What a blessed gift the book, the Bible, is. Why does he reveal himself to us? Well, because he is our father. From one man he made every nation of mankind to live over the entire face of the earth. He determined the appointed times and boundaries where they would live. He did this so that they would seek God and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, Indeed, we are also his offspring. 
Indeed, one of the first things that we learn in the Bible is how God created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He simply said, let there be, and it was. He spoke creation into existence. Yet even though he made all things, and it was indeed very good, as he said, he made something very special. It was his creation of man that was different. God created man, he created us in his own image. Genesis chapter 2 tells us how he specifically took the time with Adam, formed him out of the dust of the earth, and breathed into him the breath of life. We are the only part of creation that has an eternal soul. Paul quotes some of Athens' poets back to them, for they made some correct statements, even though, of course, they had the wrong conclusions. We indeed are God's children. And that is why God took the time and the effort to redeem us. We were made in his glorious image, but that image was marred. We rebelled against him in sin. Yet, our God loved us and took the painstaking time to promise us a savior from our sins. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to take on our flesh to fulfill the law that we failed to keep. Then Jesus was crucified to bear all of our sins on the cross, and once and for all, he suffered, and it was finished. This had to be done, because if it was not done for us, well, we'd be lost in judgment. Although God overlooked the time of ignorance, he is now commanding all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he appointed. We were, of course, dead in our trespasses and sins. Nothing we could do to reach out to God, to make contact with him, for we were dead. Yet God has made us alive. Now, because we have been made alive, he wants us to repent and to believe in him. The fact of the matter is that all men have to answer for what they have done. This was a fact that the Athenians could get on board with. Many different religions, of course, have the concept of an afterlife in them. Certainly, these polytheists would agree. They had a whole entire god who was responsible for the dead, Hades, the lord of the underworld. But what Paul said in the details is different than what they were accustomed to. Paul said that they would be judged not by a god, but by a man, one that God appointed They might have had an inkling of who Paul was talking to, talking about rather, but he didn't get the chance to introduce him more fully. How come? What happened that all of a sudden cut Paul's time down? He provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them started to scoff, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So Paul left the council. Paul really had them there for a while, but when he introduces this subject of resurrection, then that was the limit for these men. The subject of Christ's resurrection was, to them, in their logical minds, the straw that broke the camel's back. It made them scoff. Others might have wanted to hear more, as they said, but his time was now over, and he was politely invited to leave. Maybe you noticed on the hymn board or in your front of your bulletin this morning, that it is Septuagesima Sunday. What does that term mean? Well, there's more information about it in the back of your bulletin, but basically it is the Latin term for 70 days. Yes, we are about 70 days away from Easter. These next few Sundays act as a kind of a transition period between the seasons of Epiphany and the season of Lent which ultimately, of course, transitions us into the season of Easter. These next few Sundays, they will prove that the resurrection of Jesus, that is what we are looking forward to. And even though we are only 70 plus days away from Easter, quite a decent amount of time, we're never that far from removed from Easter Sunday. And it was, of course, that subject of Easter that got Paul thrown off the stage. Man rising from the dead, after all, that is preposterous. You can see how they would think that to be the case. 
After all, they'd never seen that happen, but it did. Paul cites it here, the resurrection, that is, as proof that this man, Jesus, would be the one to whom would judge the whole world. He would go on to write to the other Greeks, that is, the Corinthians, just exactly what Jesus' resurrection means to the believer. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. The fact of the matter is that Jesus' resurrection is the cornerstone on which our faith is built. As Paul said, it is our proof. It is the proof that Jesus is who he said he was. It is the proof that our sins have indeed truly been forgiven. And it is the proof that we too, even after we are dead, shall, be ri- shall rise again. Not only to those who believe in the resurrection of the dead is this true, but to those who don't believe. Then, as Paul said, the man, that is Jesus, will judge the world in his righteousness. So how did Paul do here? How would you evaluate his sermon? Well, perhaps it didn't go exactly the way that he wanted it to go. He would have no doubt loved to get the chance to have more time to explain more fully who this man was, Jesus Christ, true man and true God. But just because it didn't seem to go over well doesn't mean that it wasn't effective. There were multiple people, we're told, who believed. A council member of the Oropagus named Dionysus and a woman named Demarius, as well as others. As Jesus says in Luke I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What is the takeaway from all of this? Well, Paul essentially took an opportunity, a period of time, which he was simply waiting for his companions to come to him and turned it into an opportunity to share the life-saving gospel of Jesus. He told people, who had not heard what the real religion was. These people, of course, they were religious, but the real religion is found in the real God. Sure, some scoffed at the Apostle Paul, but others did believe. We preach the word in season and out. Jesus, just look at the doctrine here that Paul introduces to these people. He made known to them their unknown God, the real God. He told them that he was the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He told them the the nature of this one true God. He didn't act like the other gods that they were used to, who were on your side one day, against you the next. He wasn't a God who dwelt away in a faraway mountain. No, he was a God who is near to each of us. And this message that Paul preaches here, it's still timeless. It still applies today. We who know this God and know what Paul said to be the truth still need to hear the message that those who had never heard these things before heard. The message is a simple one. Our God is great. He desires that we repent and that we believe in him. So to us here today, the point is don't be ashamed of being religious. There is a temptation here today, I think, to kind of compartmentalize our faith life with our real life. We go to church on Sunday, but then is that the extent of our faith? Or is it evident throughout the other parts of our lives? We often suffer from a weakness of not wanting to look foolish, I think. Maybe we don't want to share this glorious message because we don't want to be seen as a religious fool. But the truth is, that something that Paul clearly understood here, the day of judgment, it's coming. We need to tell people that they're not just okay living in their incorrect truth. There's only one truth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We may be viewed as foolish for believing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. 
Well, that's fine. It's better to be seen as a fool by the world and to know the truth by faith. We know that Jesus died for even my sins. And we know that because he did that and rose from the dead, our sins are 100% forgiven. And death is never the end for us. This is the only truth that saves. And it is one that people need to be made known. So let us not shy away from our own personal aeropaguses that are presented in our life. We may be looked to look like fools, and it could even happen that we're not just looked as fools, but we're hated for what we say. But it doesn't matter, because what we're saying is the truth. Believe and preach that truth. God created us as his own dear children and desires all men everywhere to be saved. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus rose from the dead, and so too shall we. Our sins truly have been forgiven, and we shall be with him forever because he is with us forever. Amen.